Arthur Schlesinger. I have no doubt at all that if posterity remembers the 20th century for anything, historians 500 years from now looking at the 20th century, it will be because it will be the century when man first began to break his terrestrial bonds and began the exploration of space. So that's it. As man learned, moved on, and discarded the earlier structures, he came to these. They are marked for further milestones, reserved for future missions, other reaches to other different voids. Historians five centuries from now will mark this century, this place, and they will further note that from the void, life, man, it took eons to reach this point. But once there, the centuries and years compressed into days, hours, split seconds of exploration. The wheel, the engine, the airplane, they came slowly at first, then with increasing velocity. And then this, so huge, so powerful, so different that no ordinary modern name would suffice. They reached backward through antiquity to Roman mythology, and they named it Saturn. Saturn. His father was heaven, his mother earth. organization, the mammoth machines, the incredibly detailed technical knowledge, the dedication. It was all harnessed, sharpened to a fine edge, and focused. The program developed and matured. Apollo 17 was launched at night, and even the old hands, the hardened veterans of the space program, couldn't help but feel the awe and wonder and excitement. In the excitement of the split second of exploration, man doesn't stop to freeze the moment in history, to look at it and ask what it means. He simply lives it out. But in the Apollo program, on their way to the moon, they found a way to live out their strange moments in those strange spacecraft. It may be the peculiar nature of Americans to make history and to have fun in the making. and had fun because they, we, were confident of success. But the program teaches lessons. Confidence is a transitory thing. Apollo 13. Hey, Houston, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please? Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Stand by, 13, we're looking at it. Three days out, barreling toward the moon, an explosion. No one would see the problem for some time, but they went to work on it. The people of Apollo coalesced into a single dedicated unit, linked themselves with their technology, and cheated tragedy. A new chapter in space history was written in Mission Control. Eugene Krantz was the flight director when the problem developed. Uh, throughout this entire uh, next several days, there was one dominant thought 
uh, in the minds of all of the uh, flight controllers. Uh, we teach them that, that between God, country, and your own capability, uh, that you can solve any problem that may occur in flight. Uh, throughout the entire course of Apollo 13, there was never any death that we'd get the crew back. So there was a very positive approach, and with this kind of approach, uh, you can solve just about any problem that comes up. Solve any problem, country, capability, old-fashioned words during a time when some said the old-fashioned virtues were forgotten. Well, they weren't forgotten. They were translated into action, into programs which took man soaring above the surface of the moon, away from Earth, but always looking back on it. These divided thoughts, the moon, the Earth, run through the Apollo program a sort of theme. They went there flying in their graceful machines, but they always thought back to where they came from. Perhaps that's natural. The moon is a strange place for men to be flying to. If it's strange for men, for mankind, it's stranger still for the individual man. Harrison Schmidt, Dr. Harrison Schmidt, a geologist, he touched the moon and remembers how it was when Apollo 17 was making its descent, the last flight to the moon, the last time that man walked on its surface. Schmidt remembers how it was. One's first feelings are a mixture, a very complex mixture of humility, of excitement because of something you had planned to do was being accomplished, but of a great attention to detail, to, do, to the detail that you had thought about and learned about for so many years prior to the actual event. That detail keeps you occupied with where your hands are and where your feet are, which rung they might be. You try to remember, well, am I at the bottom of the rung? And then as one moves away and tests his way on the surface of the moon and looks around, and in my case, looked around a very magnificent valley, you see a rolling, hilly country that is interspersed with some blocky fields of rocks that you know because you've studied the photographs, and you saw them as you descended surround large craters that have been formed in that rolling countryside. These rolling dark hills merge in the distance a few kilometers away 